If you can start by telling us your name and your rank. Well, my name is Reginald. That's my first name. My family name is Willis, W-I-L-L-I-S. And I got the name Reginald because my father was in the U.S. Army in the First World War, 1917-1918 war, and he had an English friend with that name, and I was named after his English friend. That's all I know <laughs> about how I got that name Reginald. But uh, so, th so that's it. Now, and as far as what is your rank? Now, I don't know what you mean. Did right? you have a rank uh, in the service, or well, how, what was uh, your station? Oh, my military service. Uh, I was drafted in oh. the army, and uh, the war was over. Uh, you know, the war ended, the, I'm talking the Second World War, ended in uh, 1945. And uh, I turned 18 in 1945 in January, and the war was still going on. And so I was a senior in high school, and they gave me a deferment to finish high school, so I finished high school in June of 1945. Well, uh, I, uh, in January I had registered for the Army, and I went up and I took the physical, passed the physical, but he says, look, we'll give you a deferment until you finish high school, which they did. So in June of 1945, I went up and I had to take the physical again, passed it. And I fully expected to go in the army. So they called me in. They says, We don't want you now. We'll call you back in six months. <laughs> now, this is kind of a strange story. Now, the thing was, we didn't realize that the war was about over. And the army was looking ahead. You know, uh, this is my supposition, mm -hmm. that, that when the war was over, they had drafted men in 1940, they had to serve for the duration plus six months. They were in the Army five years. So in September of 1945, they had to let these guys out of the Army. The Army lost its, all its privates. Uh, uh, so. And, you know, I had that six months sort of thing. So in January 4th, 46, I went up and I got drafted in the Army. Uh, the war was over, but, you know, this is talking about the actual fighting, but legally the war was not over because they hadn't signed a peace treaty. <laughs> you know, there's lots of these little things and... Uh, so uh, they didn't know how long they could keep me. So I was in the Army four days as a draftee, and they came around and says, look, if you will sign up an enlistment in the regular Army for a year and a half, will you give you $100 on the spot? Well, this was in January of 1946, <laughs> so a lot of money for yeah. an 18-year-old. So I bit, and I, you know, signed over so I'd, they'd have me for 18 months because they wanted to keep, they'd lost all their privates. You know, some guy got drafted in 1940, they had to let them out. And so, okay, so then January 46, they called me up. And they didn't know how long they could keep me then. And at four days, they says, look, you sign up an enlistment for 18 months, and we'll give you $100 on the spot. Now, this is the 4th of January, 1946. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And so then I got $100, and I was in the regular Army, and they had me for 18 months. So they had privates because 
the army, and you know, these guys that drafted for over a four or five year period, they had to let them all out. And uh, so I was in, and this oddball time <laughs> was the only way I could describe it. So in January 46, I went in, and, and uh, I signed up for an 18 month enlistment, and they sent me down to Camp Crowder, Missouri, down in the Ozarks, which is one of them temporary World War II camps. Not that it doesn't exist anymore. And I did my basic training, you know, Army basic training, which is about two months or so. I, mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up in the Quartermaster Corps. And uh, uh, they sent me to Signal Corps school. And, uh, but I was in Signal Corps school over in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And that was a year and a half course. Well, they they didn't have me. They only had me for six months. They says, "Look, you got to sign up for it." I said, "No, I'm not interested in a military career." So they sent me out, and I became a private in the quartermaster corps, and ended up on Okinawa. You know, the island the yeah. south of Japan. <laughs> This was in, oh, in the spring of 46, 1946. Uh, so I served my year and a half there as a private. <coughs> I was a, a bookkeeper. Uh, my military occupational specialty number was stock record clerk. And what I did, I had a uh, a set of records for army boots and I had one card for each size like uh, seven or eight D or si uh, you know, the sizes and so we'd get in a shipment of boots this was in the quarter I was in the quartermaster in the depot that was like a deposit in the bank. And then some sergeant would come out and he would draw out a set or two of books. That was like a check. So I was like a, a bookkeeper in a bank. Only I was keeping records of shoes. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so this is what I did in the Army. Okay. <laughs> Well, after a year and a half, why, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd signed up so they, they, because they didn't know how long they could keep me. You know, duration of the war plus six months, they didn't, they didn't right. and this is in World War II, at the end of World War II, everything was, well, it was a mess. Yeah. So, anyway, I signed up for that year and a half, and uh, so, in the spring of 47, I got my discharge. I was a, a PFC in the Army, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I'd been a good boy, hadn't gotten any trouble, and uh, got out and came back and I went to college up at Western on the GI Bill. Oh. I want to ask. Uh, uh, Kaylin to figure out some questions to ask you. She may want to ask you about that too, about your experience up there. Would you like to ask Mr. Wilson anything? Yeah, um, the Quartermaster Corps. Can you explain further, like, what that is? Quartermaster Corps. All right, you've got to be careful. Mm -hmm. It means one thing for the Army and okay. another thing for the Navy. I didn't know that. Okay. The Quartermaster Corps in the Army is the supply section. In the Navy, a quartermaster is a guy that steers the ship. Oh. That's so, uh, but I was in the Army, so I was in the Army Quartermaster Corps. I was a private and uh -huh. was discharged as a PFC. And, uh, but that's what it was. It was the Army Supply Department, still called the Quartermaster Corps in the Army. I never knew that distinction. I never knew that at all. Yeah. 
but but you see in the navy the quartermaster is the guy that yeah the steers uh, you know it, you know it's true and i think the civilian uh, oh ships too they call that that job the quartermaster the guy that steers the ship Does that help explain it mm -hmm. all right you got what else you got um the gi's with at western you said that was what uh the gi's at um bill uh west something about western Western Illinois. Yeah. Uh, I'm, she's not sure what the GI Bill was. Yeah. Can you explain All to her right. what the GI? Because that's how you got to go to college, wasn't it? Uh, Is that how you went to college? Uh, you see, at the end of the war, uh, before the war, there had been a lot of unemployment. So the army, the government passed the law that if you served in the army, you could go to school. And they would get, well, I got $50 a month to live on, and they paid the expenses right. going to college. That was a good deal. So, you know, there were millions of guys getting out, you know, and they didn't want these guys out. Well, they had the, if you just wanted to sit around and do nothing, they had the 52, uh, they give you $20 a week for 52 weeks. <laughs> well, I didn't take that. I wasn't interested in that. When I got out, I... Well, but I was interested because they, they paid they paid for me to go to college. Right. You know, it was on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were three or four things on that GI Bill. There was the, uh, you know, the, for paying for the college. And then they had a thing about buying houses. You could That's get right. loans. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there were some guys that, you know, they just went down and drew their twenty dollars a week for a year. <laughs> it did nothing. But I wasn't when I got out. Well, I was interested in going to college, so I went over to Western. Well, actually, I'd take a take the term at Western just before I went in the army in the fall of '45. I got one one quarter, and they were on the quarter system then. And I came back in the spring of uh, 47, and I went back to Western. Well, I had one term, that one quarter, that fall quarter, 45. In the, in the summer term of 47, I went in, into Western on the GI Bill. Now, they paid the expenses. Now, I got $50 a month to live on. And uh, they paid the college expenses, they paid for the books, and the, all that stuff was paid for. Because, I'll tell you this, because it would work differently for my brother. My brother was in the Korean War, and they, the, the, I was under World War II GI Bill. That bill expired. Now, they had a new GI Bill for the guys that were in the Korean War, like my brother. Well, they just gave me $50 and then they paid. When they set that thing up, so it, they would pay for any college in the country. Don't make a difference what they, If you went to MIT, you happened to be the most expensive school in the country at that time. They would pay the tuition of the MIT and the books and all that. But. Now this was on that World War II GI Bill. Now my brother was drafted under the, uh, it was slightly different for a Korean War. He was in the Korean War. When he got out, I think he got $75 a month, but he had to pay for his books and that sort of thing. It, it actually meant it, it was a wash, you know. He, he, he got a, a equivalent to what I got, you know, going to Western, because he went to Western, too. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the situation of that. So I went and to Western and uh, did my four years and got my bachelor's. Matter of fact, I had some time left over. So I went up to the University of Iowa, and I did three terms up at Iowa. Uh, 
in the graduate school, and between Western and Iowa, I, there were certain things I like. Iowa had dormitories. Western at that time did not have men's dormitories. It was they had a woman's dormitory, but there was no men's dormitory. I went to Iowa. Iowa had a regular dormitory. It had three or four hundred. Well, they had a woman's separate dormitory for the women, and, and but they had the a men's dormitory. Men's dormitory had three or four hundred guys living in it, and. Uh, uh, you know, I had that experience, and we had foreign students there. Uh, now, when I was up there at Iowa, we got the first German exchange students after the Second World War were there. And, you know, I met these guys that had gone to the University of Berlin. They were Germans, and they were over there as the exchange students. And, of course, you know, being out in the middle of Iowa was quite an experience for them. <laughs> and, you know, they were telling me about, about things in uh, Germany. Uh, and uh, that, and, well, there were some others. You even had an Egyptian student. So we had uh, these various foreign students, which we didn't have at Western at that time. Nowadays they have uh, foreign students at Western. Well, they're probably up here at Quincy University. They, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. they have some uh, foreign students. Mm -hmm. But when I uh, first went to Western, I, uh, there weren't any, but we, we had them at Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, Iowa had this, uh, they had several dormitories, and this and I stayed in, they had three or four hundred students. And, uh, but as near as I can t tell you, the, the coursework was about the same at most schools. The only, because uh, I went to, uh, Western did not have a men's dormitory then, you know, it was, well, basically, it was a teacher's college, and of course, I was a country boy, and uh, so it worked out well. And I was worked out pretty well on that score. Okay. And uh, so from there, I moved to Chicago, and uh, I got a job working. Let's see working in a bank as a bank clerk in Chicago mm -hmm. and I was up there several years and uh, I went to night school in Chicago. Now uh, the uh, after you know I had worked in a bank all day and I get off about four or five o'clock in the afternoon I was about a mile west of the downtown the loop and I take the streetcar over to the loop and I went to night school uh -huh. in the loop. They had several thousand students going to school in the loop, the different schools. Well, f first, I, let's see, what it, uh, I took some courses pertaining to money and banking and such at night, and I saw there was a lot of guys that were working, and then they come out to night school, and you know you'd meet meet these. Uh, uh, there were a few women in that. Now there were uh, you know a, f a fair percentage of the students at Western at Iowa, say roughly probably maybe fifty percent were women. And, uh, let's see, uh, Western did not have a men's dormitory then, they had a woman's dormitory, but they put a lot of students out to live in with families. Mm -hmm. And Iowa had both men's and women's dormitories. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I knew, uh, you know, uh, there were women 
in most schools. And the same thing when I was going to night school there in Chicago. Uh, Have you got something else you want to go through on here? And uh, there were. Uh, Did you want? There was there something here you wanted to ask? We're yeah. looking for another question <laughs> here. Okay. Yeah. Um. In your biography information, it says you were shipped to National the China government. You, what? You were shipped to the National China government to fight the Chinese Communist. Shanghai Shek. Shanghai Shek. Uh, well, I really had nothing to do with it, except when I was in the army, they shipped me to Okinawa. Now this was in, uh, see, I guess the spring of 46. and. The last battle of the Second World War was fought on Okinawa, right. and they had, you know, oodles of stuff left over, you know, that the, they had from, you know, the the army. They had a whole several miles of trucks and stuff Supplies like that. and uh, mm -hmm. rations. Well, when I arrived on Okinawa, we, you know, and I was in the, in the army. And I was working as a bookkeeper in the, this uh, quartermaster you know, supply section. They were shipping that stuff to Shanghai, China for the Chinese nationalists, the, not wow. the communists. The nationalists still had the mainland, and we were supplying them, and they were. And I was at the pole in the harbor there, Naha, Okinawa. They were loading truck tires and things like that, and, and uh, trucks and stuff like that, you know, because they, they had all that equipment left over from, left over from uh, World War II. And they shipped that stuff to Shanghai. Well, it was for the Chinese nationalists, but they collapsed, and the communists got it. So, for the next 30 years, I'd be seeing movies about the Chinese communists, and they had these U.S. Army trucks, that they, and they were 1940 Dodges, and here they were, and they were painted OD color, and the, the Chinese Army had all these uh, uh, trucks that We'd given to the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese, when the communists took over from the nationalists, they ended up with all this. Uh, for 20 years, they were using those darn trucks. I'd see movies. Of, How'd that make you feel when, when that happened? What, did you, <laughs> well, I, what was I, your reaction to that? Well, I just uh, chuckled. You know, I accepted because I knew this, the background of it, and uh, you know, I think the same thing happened on a lesser scale uh, with the uh, Russians and the uh, Finns. They had a little war with Finland before the Second World War, and the Russian army, I guess the Russians they had like Model A Ford trucks, you know, in 1940. And so you see pictures of these Russian trucks, and they were like a 1940 Model A Ford, you know, uh, just a regular truck. It was used what the Russian Army, we'd given them a bunch of you know, that stuff. So, and then, but in the case of uh, that stuff from uh, the, uh, the end of the war, uh, you know, in 45, that, that we shipped to Shanghai, and uh, first the Nationals got it, then the Communists got it. They were 1940 Dodge trucks, looked just like a 19, only they were painted OD color. Right. And, uh, you know, the, I just chuckled when I saw them because I knew the history behind them. And, uh, 
Now, what else? Do you have something else on there that you wanted to ask about that? Anything that's that or related or something different? Um, besides, you worked in civil service and then you worked for Navy as a civilian. Oh well, that was later in yeah. my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I. Uh, you know, I was in the Army. Well, I got out and I went to college on the GI Bill. And I took a bachelor's degree. And then I went up to Chicago and I worked in a bank for several years. Uh, and learned, basically I learned the banking business. And uh, then after four or five years, Chicago was cold, so <laughs> I moved to San Francisco. California. I think, uh, are you from around there? I am. Andrew's it's from around that area. She, she knows how cold it gets up there. Well, I, you know, I moved into San Francisco and the, and the weather was warm. <laughs> and I got a job <laughs> uh, working uh, for the Department of Defense as a civilian. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I was in the supply section, and, uh, you know, I'd taken a high school bookkeeping course, and every place I went, I was a bookkeeper, <laughs> keeper, set of books. And so I was out there in uh, San Francisco, and uh, I was working, you know, as a, as a bookkeeper for that stuff. And uh, the war was over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now I worked for, also. worked for Bechtel Corporation, a large defense contractor in San Francisco. And they had a contract with the government to build a naval base in the Philippine Islands, Subic Bay Naval Base. I mean, it was a monster project. Right. Now, do you remember what year that was? Uh, well, it was, was right in the right late 40s, and uh, they worked on that thing project for about 10 years. Okay. They leveled off. Uh, there was a bay up north of uh, on the island in the Philippines' main island, Luzon. There was a bay up further north. They leveled off the... Uh, uh, the water and made uh, like an airplane runway mm. in this bay which is up the coast n not not next to Manila but up the coast was another bay and they filled that in and they built runways for airplanes now they I didn't realize at the time but I think they saw the Vietnam war coming along. So they prepared for it. Strategic. They were trying to be strategic with it. Yeah. So they built this uh, this big uh, air base in, uh, in the Philippine Islands as a backup for, you know, the business over in Vietnam. That's probably right. And uh, so I worked on, I was, I was a civilian on that job, and uh, that was, uh, so they built this naval base, and spent millions of dollars. They leveled off the land so they'd have runways for airplanes to come in, I mean full-sized airplanes. And then they'd have aircraft carriers that come into this bay and they'd unload the planes there and they, they had facilities for repairing airplanes at Subic Bay and I was working in the, in the section that had to do with this you know they, uh, they'd re, you know, the planes they used in the uh, Vietnam War over you know, in, in uh, you know, in Vietnam, you know, they, they shipped the airplanes back to the Philippines to repair them. 
so they could reuse them. And uh, so the Philippines ended up with a big runway and uh, with all sorts of industrial facilities. And eventually we gave it back to them. So they, the Philippines had developed that into an industrial thing, you know, which, because they don't want people, you know, building that stuff down in the harbor at Manila. You know, this was up the coast uh, 50 or 100 miles or so, out of sight, so to speak. Mm. So they, uh, so I worked on that job for a few, uh, well that was one of them they sent me over and uh, I worked for this contractor that was building this uh, this uh, naval base that which they used in the Vietnam War. Now I understand that in this last thing, this over there in the Middle East, the English owned some islands down in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and uh, the remove the natives from it's it's right in the middle of the ocean four or five hundred miles south of uh, right they have these islands they belong to England and they removed them and there were the natives they cleared that out for um, military, and they made, uh, military made a big military base down there which they used in this uh, Vietnam stuff uh, I just know that by hearsay. You know, I, I know because I, I have an idea of what was going on, and uh, once in a while you'd see something about it. But that uh, makes sense for strategic reasons. They want to have, and this all sounds planned out. You know, yeah, so they like planned it's thought this out before. Uh, you know, they, they they are planning for the next war right now. I don't know whether they figure well <laughs> we're going to fight here or. Sometimes it doesn't materialize. Makes you wonder. Makes but you wonder. but anyway, I just accepted the, you know things as they came. And uh, I wanted I wanted her to ask you. You want to ask him uh, some uh, more about family? She wanted to ask some family questions. Okay. Through your uh, going from Western to Chicago to San Francisco, yeah. have you ever married or? No, I never married. I had two brothers. They're both married. Uh, and now, they, well, all three of us went to Western. Oh. And uh, uh, the brothers next to me, uh, he, well, he's, well, and the other brother, my younger brother, they're both married. And they both went to Western, and the one next to me t uh, took a degree in uh, oh, uh, 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 you know, it was uh, uh, like industrial arts or something like that. And the other guy took a degree in music. Is that right? Yeah, he was a high school band man. <laughs> And she's in music. All right, now he really landed a plum. <laughs> he was you know, a high school you know, band teacher, and he had a friend some way. He got a job teaching in a band in an American school in Saudi Arabia. He was over there several years. <laughs> and uh, he made he made a lot of money. Now the the, the kicker on that, uh, he had come back because he wasn't in a pension plan out there. And he, he got back into the Illinois, is teaching uh, you know like music in the Illinois uh, high school. So he uh, you know uh, you know being in a, in a regular high school pension plan because he made a lot of money in Arabia, but 
uh, he was he was out of the pension plan. The other guy he was a high school oh, uh, a liberal or, or uh, industrial arts teacher and that sort of thing. Shop class. Yeah. My dad actually taught that. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, so those guys both made their careers. The one went to Arabia in that van thing and he made a lot of money over there and he so he came back but he wasn't in any pension plan so he had got he got back in the state system so he uh, got a, a pension from the uh, you know the uh, teachers pension system and uh, so uh, uh, now did you we're, we're about to wrap did you have any other question you wanted to Find out. I've got one more question before we close. If you, I wanted to ask you one more question. We're, we're getting ready to wrap up the interview. Okay. I wanted to get your opinion on something. Yeah. Now, have you been? I don't know if you watch the news very much on what's happening now with oh. the wars and with the politicians. Do you? How do you reflect on that after your service and after World, the era of World War II? What does it feel like now? Well. You have a, any reflections on that? Uh, are we headed in the right direction, or are we having no, problems? Uh, that, that is a very hard question. It I, is kind uh, of a tough question. I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I watch it, I, I see it, and uh, uh, I... Uh, With the young people in class, we talk about this a lot because they're at the point where now they've got to start figuring out what they're going to do, and so we're yeah. always trying to find the best advice to give them. Well, the first place, we don't use very many military anymore. There's very few jobs in that respect, mm -hmm. and there's no draft. Nixon right. abolished the draft. That's 30 years ago. Right. So there's no draft, and uh, we're not the only ones. The Europeans also abolished the draft. The French, the Germans, and all that. Right. Now, one reason is it's a volunteer army. It's all with, all volunteer. All right. This was done by Nixon when he was the president, and I, you know, I, I knew what he did. And I knew why he did. It. Now the reason is, this new stuff costs so much money, they can't afford to build it and put everybody through a boot camp. Yeah. You know, like they used to draft everybody went through this 12-week military training. Right. But they, they, they simply can't afford that. So everybody abolished uh, their universal military training because They'd have so they'd have money to build uh, this new equipment they need. Yeah. A lot of technology running things now. No, you know it's it, it's all high tech stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's there's a few. Oh, you know, like uh, like Marines or you know, uh, but but they're relatively. It's not like. The old days when they drafted everybody and they put them through uh, army basic training, they're not doing that, and neither are the French or the Germans or uh, any of these other countries. See, the French had a universal military training from the time of Napoleon up until about 50 years ago. In order for them to have money to build new military stuff, they couldn't afford to, to, to draft, so they, they stopped the draft so they, they could spend the money on developing this new stuff that's coming out. Yeah. It's a lot different now, I think. Yeah. And all countries are the same way. Yeah. Now, nobody has the the draft anymore, and that's the, Nixon was the one to stop that because 
you know, he saw that, you know, they needed the money if they were going to build this new stuff because the new stuff costs four or five times what the old, uh, yeah. like they build a new airplane, costs four or five times what they want, want it replaced. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, and they're all concerned that they have the latest in the way of military equipment. Those yeah. who can afford it. It's a different kind of military thing now. Everything has changed around. Oh yeah. The, uh, the uh, so and then the people are they don't need privates. I remember at the end of the Second World War. I was processing through, and I met a guy. He was an American soldier and served in World War II. He had the World War II victory medal. Perfect soldier. But he wasn't too bright. He wanted to make a career in the Army. The Army wouldn't let him re-enlist because they didn't. They wanted guys with brains. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I met that guy and I felt sorry for him, but I understood, you know, what the, the Army's attitude toward him. So, uh, the, and, of course, the French, French had universal military training from the time of Napoleon up until after the Second World War. They drafted every, every man in France, when they reached their 18th birthday, did a year as a trainee in the French Army, the Universal Military Training. They abolished it. You know, I'm using them as a classic example. England didn't have that, right. and uh, but the French had that, and and uh, oh, the French did. Those guys only got five bucks a month. To, <laughs> didn't get very much money. They give them, you know, they but. But, you know, they couldn't afford it. And uh, so uh, they've all... And then, then, of course, you've got the same situation with the Chinese and uh, the, the uh, Russians, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, of course, the Chinese, uh, the Russians. Uh, so they, they, there's no... Universal military training by these countries. So, you know, you, you know, it used to be that, it, you know, you turned 18, you registered for the draft, and you knew you were going to be in the army. Well, I know my mom is 90, almost 94. Yeah. My dad served in Midway, and uh, yeah, and um, he's gone now. But uh, I learned a lot from my parents. Yeah. Things have changed around, so we're what we're trying to do is get these students um, yeah. to learn about all of what where we all came from. And so yeah. we want to we want to thank you for this interview. We're going to close up the interview now, but okay. we really do appreciate uh, your yeah. service and helping us do this. Well, you know that's the way I see it, and uh, you know I accept the changes. We got to accept the changes. That's we all have to do that. I think that's how just how it goes. But it's uh, and there's the fact that you know they uh, they 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 want a few highly trained. Well, the Marines uh, kind of a, you know like the old. They, they want a smaller, smaller army. units. Yeah. Yeah. And they so they. they uh, you know, it's not like in uh, World War Two, and uh, uh, and it's it's not, not just us. It's all around the world. I think the, these countries like France and Germany right. and England never did have that uh, universal military training, and uh, but all those European countries had that universal military training from the time of Napoleon. Yep. And, uh, but, but it was Nixon, you know, he really saw what was coming on. I, mm -hmm. uh, that's something I don't like about the guy, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember, I remember that period. I remember that period pretty well. And, uh, 
he, uh, I thought he was right in what he did in that respect. And uh, so it's, uh, but what they need or uh, well, I really don't know what to tell you about, uh, you, know, you know, if... Well, you've told us quite a bit. Yeah. It, you know, that we're going to close it up now, but because we have to go to our next interview, but um, we want to thank you. All right. Now, you go by Reg? Yeah, I go by Reg. Okay, Reg, well, please thank our interviewee. Thank you for, for your time. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. And I want we, to shake your hand, too. Thank you yeah. for your service, sir. Well, I... I'm glad to you know, give you the views as I see it because it's been a big change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, I've tried to keep an open mind on it. And uh, I think we all have to keep an open mind. That, that's that's a good a good piece of advice. Yeah, Very and good piece uh, of advice. because. You know, you can figure you're not going to have to serve, you know, get drafted and serve as a private, like in the French Army, on a certain date every year. Why yeah. all the men of that age entered the army and and uh, did a year's service, and they you know, they didn't make much money. You know, they had universal military service, and that. I guess started back in Napoleon's time, I think so. and uh, I used them as the classic example. And the Germans, of course, had the same system, and the Russians. And, uh, well, we'll just we'll just uh, close it by saying, how about if we just.